Survivor Guatemala was a roller coaster of a season, and although I wouldn't say it was one of my favorite seasons, it was an amazing one nonetheless, with a breathtaking location never repeated again uh, to a very memorable cast, dare I say one of the best ones the show has ever seen. I definitely loved this season, and it was really the first, it was also the first season to feature returning players in Stephanie and Bobby John from Palau, and it had probably the most complicated tribe swap I've ever seen, but on the other hand, it did the best job at shuffling around the tribal loyalties uh, in a way that totally flipped the uh, just the dynamic of the of the game. Anyways, let's look at Yasha, the tribe that came just this short of having the winner. So I chose to put Brianna at very last because not only was she an early Yasha boot, but she just didn't seem to be featured all that much. And whenever she was, it was usually in a negative light. She was portrayed as a cold person who didn't help much that much in challenges. Probably her most memorable moment in the entire game was in the hoop ball immunity challenge in episode three. I think uh, that she she didn't understand the plays that Stephanie was trying to call. Like I think she was trying to call like a flick or so. I don't remember what the exact term was, and she didn't really know what. Stephanie was talking about, and she didn't seem to care all that much either, and after Yasha lost that challenge, her tribe was getting very sick of her, so they voted her out. Once again, a tribe's first boot narrowly escapes the very bottom of my list, and that's because Morgan really did seem to have her head in the game. She really did seem to enjoy her time in Guatemala, it's just that she wasn't all that helpful around camp. Can we also take a moment to acknowledge that her occupation is literally a magician's assistant? That's not something we see on Survivor that often. Anyways. In episode 2, Yasha lost their their first immunity, and it was looking like it would be either Morgan or Lydia that were going, with some people wanting one person gone and others wanting the other. But in the end, it was Richard Hatch 2.0 Brian Corridan who pulled enough strings to get Morgan gone, as he liked to do very mo often in the pre-merge. That's right, I'm already digging into some of the players who made the merge. Jamie was always sort of aggressive, a little bit too judgmental, but he was always in the pre-swap, but he was always safe in the pre-swap because he was arguably the strongest male on the tribe. Then he gets switched to Nakum in episode 4, where he remained safe as the swap was so wonky, it put the original Nakum who stayed on Nakum in the minority. Well, not exactly, but we'll touch on that later. Because of this, Jamie wrote it safely to the merge. It didn't even matter that much as post-swap Nakum was kind of a powerhouse, so they didn't even go to council that often. Uh, yeah, I think the only time post-swap that they lost one challenge, and then the other, the only other time they went to council before the merge was because of the double elimination, which technically they won that immunity still, but they still had to go. Um, and even at the merge, though, Jamie remained safe as post-swap Nakum outnumbered post-swap Yasha by two. But here's the thing. Jamie was not someone that you would want in your camp. He was always butting heads with people, namely Bobby John and Gary, and he was also growing very, very paranoid that he was going to get blindsided. Very quickly, his alliance started to realize that they could afford to cut him loose before finishing up the other players at Shakum. So, Rafe spearheaded his blindside after getting sick of Jamie begging for reassurance of his safety, and funnily enough, Jamie has a positive reaction to his elimination. He even compliments the remaining players on executing a perfect blindside. With all that in mind, he wasn't a great player, and he didn't do all that much, at least strategic-wise, and he also just kind of seemed sort of unlikable at times. I was worried that Amy was going to go out almost every time Yasha went to Tribal Council, which was a lot. She was older and got injured badly in only Episode 3, but she was a tough woman, which makes sense that she had developed this tough New England cop persona. And this woman is probably one of the toughest women I've ever seen on this show, even though she didn't make it to the merge by just one Tribal Council. It's crazy to think all the councils she survived when it seemed like it was time for her to go. She was kept on Yasha at the swap along with only Gary and Brian, with four Nakums joining them. That means that those three were in the minority on their own tribe. They were still able to survive for one round as Brian was a master manipulator and Danny wasn't the most loyal to her fellow Nakum. But sadly, post-swap Yasha was a nightmare and once it was just down to her and Gary for original Yasha's, she had run out of lives. Brian is definitely one of the most underrated players to play the game, and he, I even thought of bumping him to, to four. He was that good. It's just that he was screwed over by the swap more than any other player in the history of Survivor, in my personal opinion. Brian really was the second coming of Richard Hatch, playing a very similar Machiavellian game style, but the key difference being he was much more likable than Richard. Everyone loved him, but he was still unafraid to campaign to get who he wanted out, and for the most part, he was successful. Even when the numbers were seemingly against 
against his side at the swap. He was able to get Danny to flip on her other Nakums to keep himself, Amy, and Gary safe for at least three more days. But at the double elimination, he had run out of elbow room. Rafe had won a special individual immunity, and this time, he was able to choose in secret who he was going to keep safe for Yasha. Well, by now, even Gary and Amy were willing to kick Brian to the curb as he wasn't as good at challenges as either Bobby John or Brandon. It's looking like Rafe possibly chose to save Brian as he seemed like the target, but he ended up saving Gary, so it didn't matter and Brian was sent home anyways. Brian was one of the best strategic players this season in my opinion, and the fact that he was kept on Yasha uh, because he had the most tribal spirit at the swap, makes his downfall all the more sad and a little ironic, too. For me, at least, sometimes the GOAT archetype is hard to analyze, because in most cases, someone is a GOAT because they are highly unlikable, but other times, like Lydia, it's more because they're just simply lacking what it takes to win the game. Whether they're bad at challenges or just don't have any strategic skills, sometimes people find themselves at the end when nobody expected them to, and that's exactly what Lydia did. She started off as one of the weakest links on Yasha, to the point where she was even targeted the first time they went to Tribal Council, but once Brian shifted that target over to Morgan, Morgan, she was able to find her footing more or less. She's living proof of my first Hill theory in reality shows. She was a prime candidate for her first boot of her tribe, but the fact that she was spared gave her enough time to redeem herself before it was too late again. Then, just like the swap screwed Brian's game, it completely saved Lydia's, as she was still sort of at the bottom of the Yasha uh, pecking order, but now at y Nakum, she had the numbers to just pick off one of the original Nakum whenever they needed to vote someone off. But despite her identity as a goat, she was a very likable and caring person. Once the time came to merge, the tables had turned and she was now completely in power along with her alliance. For once it felt like she wasn't even in question to be a target. That being said, however, she was a wild card and within, within the post-swap Nakum alliance. She did show some signs of loyalty to Gary, who is now an outsider, and like they did with Jamie, her alliance slowly started to pivot their sights off of the rest of post-swap Yasha over to her. But some, um, outside influence that we'll get more into in the next video was able to force post-swap Nakum to even further cannibalize themselves, but... Lydia, but by some miracle, Lydia remained unscathed for those next two episodes. However, then at the final four, the remaining players uh, finally voted her out under the rationale that she was the most likable out of the four of them. But that just meant that she had the least blood on her hands at that point. And by voting her out, the remaining three players' chances all plummeted astronomically because any three of them would likely win against Lydia in a final two. The only other strategic reason I could find for voting out Lydia here is that it would be even footing going into the final three, where no one would be scrambling to take her. Basically, if they kept her now, she'd be guaranteed a spot at the final two. Basically, Lydia was a goat the entire time, but she was one of, if not the most likable and fun to watch goats we've ever seen on Survivor. I know, I know, putting the runner up this low seems weird to me too, but I just wasn't all that thrilled by her gameplay. It seemed too basic, and her lackeys had way too much power, and when you compare it to that to her first time playing, when she had to rely mostly on herself to make it further in the game, her gameplay this time doesn't even seem that impressive anymore. That being said, going to a predominantly newbie season as a decorated veteran of the game and coming out almost on top is pretty amazing, but I'd like to argue that she wasn't in control as much as the edit wanted you to uh, think. Take the pre-swap. Sure, she sort of elected herself as the tribe leader with the support of her other Yashas, but even later, someone remarked that it was more of out of awe than respect, as if they saw her as some celebrity. Then we realized that in those first two Yasha votes, it wasn't Stephanie who controlled them, it was more the work of Gary and Brian. Then when she went to Nakum in the swap along with Rafe, Jamie, and Lydia, her forces were equally matched with that of Nakum as it was 4-4, but she needed the loyalty of Judd to tip those scales, or else... They could have just been picked off like they actually did in reality to Nakum. Not only that, but in the merge, it appeared that Rafe and Judd were doing just as much strategic work, if not more than her, as she seemed to lay back at some times. Which brings me to my next problem with her gameplay, who she chose to work with. Now, it's normal to see good players align with bad players, or even bad people. They may even be bad people themselves. <coughs> Johnny Fair. <Fairfield. coughs> Gosh, sorry, had a tickle in my throat there. But Stephanie takes the cake when it comes to the people she worked with. 
that were bad. We have Lydia, who is already established as a goat and more of a strategic dud when it comes to this alliance. Then we have Rafe, who did most of her dirty work and won like half of the immunities, painting himself as the favorite to win. And th that's not a bad thing necessarily, but considering she spent most of the time practically attached at the hip with this guy, it makes you wonder why she never thought of cutting him when her alliance was obviously keen to the idea of blindsiding their own as they did it multiple times. Then there's Jamie, who is a loose cannon and a serious liability for her and Judd, who is also, uh, for her, um, and then there's Judd, who is also a loose cannon on top of being a compulsive liar. Finally, there's Cindy, who... Oh, okay, Cindy wasn't that bad, but there's something that happened at the final five that brought her down a few points for me that we'll talk about in the next episode. So, there you go. Stephanie's wacky alliance that she let Danny sort of be a part of for far too long. Finally, it was her Trinal Tribal Council performance that hammered the final nail for me. She did a pretty bad job at answering the questions, especially the one about removing one juror and why. When she answered Bobby John because he was the first juror. Like, what?! Not because, oh, I don't know, he probably wouldn't vote for you over the other finalist. Even, uh, even the other finalist answered the same question with Rafe for that exact same reason, because he, would, he was practically a locked vote for Stephanie. I mean, she started this game worried she was at the bottom, then sort of rose to the top, a, a lot less than production wanted you to, you know, showed, and only to let her teammates shine more than she did. And to top it all off, she blew it at Final Tribal Council. Now, I'm not saying she's a Katie or a Clay or even a Kim Johnson, but come on, Steph. Gary was the first celebrity to play Survivor, if you could even call him one. For those who don't know, Gary Hogaboom was an ex-NFL quarterback, but he never made it that, that big, so he did have some level of an anonymity. He didn't want his teammates to know his identity because they target him for being rich enough already, so he lied and said he was Gary Hawkins' landscaper. At first, I thought he'd be an early boot, as most older guys are, but he immediately shocked me with his sort of wisdom and skill in the game. Throughout the pre-swap, he was well-liked on his tribe, almost never targeted. Even at the swap when he found himself now outnumbered, he was still last on the the, the, the those Nakum's pecking order. That being said, his danger of having his cover blown began right here. Now, Danny was now on his team, and she also, she just so happened to work in the sports radio industry, so she recognized him immediately. Not only that, but she was a big fan of his too. She even, tr uh, uh, she, she even tried to out him during an immunity challenge before the swap. It was pretty funny. They were like wrestling in mud, and it was Judd versus Gary, and she said, I don't remember, she said something like, uh, like, uh, uh, he's a quarterback, you're a line, you're a lineman, or something like that, and he just, he just kind of like, what? Um, but yeah, uh, uh, but once they were on the same team, she came at him with the force of a stealth bomber, as she liked to be called. She did a good job, or she, sorry, he did a good job denying it with the biggest mistake he made, being to admitting to have gone to Central Michigan for college, but not playing football there, which, that was kind of, that was kind of dumb for him to say, because it, 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 it's just, it, everything would be, it's, it's just kind of sus. Um, nevertheless, he narrowly makes it to the merge, where he's surprisingly targeted. I would have guessed that considering the post-swap Nakum predominantly consisted of original Yashas, that they would have annexed him into their group, so to speak. Well, he watches as his other post-swap tribe mates uh, are voted out until it's time... Uh, until it's his time to go, but now it's time to explain the season's biggest twist. That at the merge, there's a hidden immunity idol that could be used before the vote to keep whoever plays it safe. Well, Gary miraculously finds it after discovering, discovering that Judd lied about its whereabouts and plays it to save his own skin. After that, though, he's back to being a target. He makes it one more episode when Jamie gets blindsided, but like so many other players, he just ran out of road to run from the majority alliance, and he was voted out in seventh. It's really not fair that Stephanie didn't have her alliance keep Gary safe long Longer, even though technically they kept him as long as they could without dipping into their own alliance. I really don't know how to feel about Rafe personally, but I do know that he deserved to win, and that's why he's at number one for me. He started this game, and it was almost like Rob Sesternino all over again, with it seeming like, aside from Steph and maybe Gary, Yasha was the story of Rafe. He had this sort of innocent and friendly facade, as if each vote was killing him inside, when he it was actually a lot more cutthroat than he let on. It's almost unnecessary to mention anything else about him before the merge, because he was probably in the best position than literally anyone 
anyone in the cast at that point. Even at the merge, everyone liked him, and almost everyone in his alliance valued him as their number one ally. He was sort of a duo with Steph, made a final two deal with Cindy during a reward, and who did Jamie run to whenever he was worried he was getting stabbed in the back? Rafe the Immunity Beast Judkins. Oh yeah, and he also won like almost every individual immunity, so add that to his already impressive resume. As I got deeper into the season, even Danny sided with him, as she needed to hold on to someone for dear life if she even wanted to think about making it another day. So they made a final two deal, but now Danny has influenced him so much that now he's in the final three with her and Stephanie and her and Stephanie. And after falling out first in the final immunity challenge, he sees Steph struggling and eventually losing and realizes that he couldn't just shut Steph out of the game because of an alliance after she fought so hard for immunity. So he sort of pulls an Ian and absolves Danny of any obligations to him, which is great for Danny because now she can vote Rafe out as he's most likely to win. Um, what's confusing is he actually seems to be mad at her for voting him out when, well, what did he expect? Even at the final five, when he's, uh, you know, I just feel like he took a lot, a lot of tone to that, and he seemed to be a re really a salty juror for no reason. And even at the final five, when he seemed to take too much offense with Cindy after she won reward, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll get into that later, because it's going to be a lot more descriptive when I explain that when I review Cindy. Um, there were just some times where I just didn't really like his attitude all that much. And for the most part, he was a very likable guy. And despite his occasional unlikable moments, he still deserved to win. And he deserves to be number one on this list. And he's still one of my favorites from this season. Well, this is, I apologize, this is a very long video, but uh, keep on the lookout for the part two of this where I talk about the Nakum tribe. Make sure to like and subscribe and comment below if, like Danny Boatwright, you have a poster of Gary Hogaboom in your room.